On today's episode of the Encrypted Economy, we tackle digital asset taxation. Now, this episode is not going to be highly technical or one that's filled with citations, so don't be scared. It's rather a mental model for thinking about digital assets, whether from a commercial sense of investing or engaging as a participant, what have you. It's meant to cover a number of different frameworks and buckets. So Jason has a knack for breaking down complicated concepts into digestible frameworks. And this is very helpful for today because even though I can get a bit nerdy on these episodes, this one, I really wanted to make sure we didn't get too deep and stayed more at the forest level with noting some trees along the way. Because sometimes people get lost in the citations. And for tax, it's, it's hard to do a podcast without it. So I think today is a mark of honor that we, we've been able to pull something off that I think will, again, I think will be helpful to, to anybody who's listening to it, who's interested in, hey, how are these things taxed? So nothing on this podcast, nonetheless, is legal advice or tax advice. And the IRS may not agree with any of it. But nonetheless, as a framework I th- for contemplating digital asset taxation, I think it's pretty compelling. So I hope you get a lot out of this episode. I was really excited with the way it turned out. So if you like it, share it, get it out there because um, you know the encrypted economy, we're adding value to the way that people think about the encrypted economy. And despite whatever goes on in the digital asset marketplace, digital assets are here to stay. And, and so is the encrypted economy. Enjoy. Welcome to The Encrypted Economy, a weekly podcast featuring discussions exploring the business, laws, regulation, security, and technologies relating to digital assets and data. I am Eric Hess, founder of Hess Legal Counsel. I've spent decades representing regulated exchanges, broker-dealers, investment advisors, and all matter of fintech companies for all things touching electronic trading with a focus on new and developing technologies. On the encrypted economy today, we're really excited to have Jason Schwartz, partner at Freed Frank, focusing on tax, but he's more than just a tax lawyer. He's a crypto lawyer who's got a lot of expertise in the ability to apply tax to crypto. So Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you. So I'm just going to, I'm going to point out um, just because it's so, I got on the podcast today and, and and Jason's wearing a blazer and what's the shirt? Help me out with the shirt. This here. is my, uh, this is my crypto, crypto number 761, which I own. My NFT. His NFT. So he's got his NFT. <laughs> I don't have I don't have an NFT emblazoned on my shirt. Um, and in fact, I was wearing a collar shirt, but then I'm like, if he's going to wear that, I got to find something. So I grabbed probably the closest thing I got, which is a Minecraft T-shirt, which I'm wearing. And I I, I don't even play Minecraft. Yeah, like, yeah, you, it's like an... You've got to up your NFT game, though. I mean... I, I got I to work on yeah, it. I got to yeah, work yeah. on I, it. I only have so, one... I, I think I only have one profile pick NFT, and it's this Cryptode. Um, I was scammed out of it at one point. Uh, and, and then was able to recover it. So it's near and dear to my heart. Um, but right. Other than that, I, I collect a lot of the uh, <laughs> long form generative art stuff, like the, the art block yep. stuff. The NFT with the story, that's what people are counting on. So, so Jason, why don't, why don't you uh, give us uh, your your Genesis block, so to speak, a little bit about you, your background, how you got into uh, digital assets? Yeah, so I, I've been practicing law for a while now. I was a partner at another law firm before Freed Frank, recently moved to Freed Frank. And the majority of my work uh, in my career to date has been in the TradFi space. So a lot of securitizations, a lot of fund formation, a lot of financial products. And during the course of my work for you know asset managers and, and financial institutions, I came across crypto you know, a couple of years ago, I guess. And uh, as soon as I started looking into it, you know, it started with just sort of like curiosity. I just wanted to know a little bit more than my clients knew. And then as soon as I started looking into it, I just you know, was was totally enthralled by the whole field. So, um, you know, not only did I get into, you know, DeFi, degening uh, on my own, but also, you know, into the like NFT and, and art world. It's kind of uh, kind of makes sense because I, I'm looking around myself. I have like tons of art on, on my walls in my in my home. So it just sort of comes naturally that I would be interested in collecting uh, in the virtual world as well. Um, and uh, I think that the tax law raises so many important issues for us in crypto. And uh, well, really crypto, I think challenges the very foundations of our tax law, that this is gonna be sort of one of the next big challenges for policymakers um, and for everyday people trying to navigate the landscape. Excellent. So um, now we're gonna get into it. So so tax law is something that uh, strikes fear in the heart of many not not just uh, uh, attorneys, uh, well, everybody who has to deal with it um, every year, but um, 
you know, there's so many different ways to, to cut up taxes. It's funny when I when I first got into crypto, I forget it was like 2015. I I, I wish I would have got and learned about it sooner. And and words like Kraken, I'm like sea monster. I'm never gonna now Kraken's like my number one thing. And somebody said I'm gonna put you in a white paper because I was working, I was doing stuff with digital assets. I just wasn't, and I was like a white paper, and I had like my own. I'm like white paper. Well, what's, what's a white paper? I mean, how can a white paper be bad? It's just a white paper. It's a paper. It's a paper, right? And I remember like finally when I got to looking at it, like I just I was oblivious. Like I just kind of thought it was meaningless. And I they're like, I give you a token. I'm like, okay, sure, whatever, right? And then they finally said, we want you to look at this thing. And I'm like, this is an offering document, right? <laughs> that was my first reaction. I'm not saying all white papers are offering documents. I'm just saying that the white paper I saw was a white, and I tore the thing to shreds. But the point was, I think taxes in many ways that way. Like, you know, we have this thing, we we have NFTs, we have DAOs, we have, and we want to say, well, no, it's, it doesn't fall in the normal cal- classifications. It's something new. It's different. Uh, maybe taxes don't apply to it, but uh, in fact, uh, that's, that's not the case. So I don't know whether that's a proper oh, no, no, no. segue. But. I think that is actually a perfect segue to what we, I think we're, we're planning on talking about today because um, you're, you're right. I, I mean, um, I think in regulatory and tax, uh, for example, any ordinary course of dealing between people is treated as an entity, right? So, so like you were talking about a white paper. Yeah, you have a few people who got together and put, you know, had this great idea and they want to solicit investments uh, to build out this great idea. And they anticipate that like if they get those investments, they can turn a lot of profit for the people who are investing, right? And that looks a lot like a securities offering. I obviously have no idea what, you know, whose white paper you're talking about. So, so you know, I'm not giving legal advice or anything, but but that's like a perfect example. And in tax law, there's, there's an analog, which is, again, you know, any arrangement between people um, where people are cooperating to to jointly earn profits and or split expenses is actually an entity for U.S. tax purposes that might require, you know, might have to pay its own taxes or have to file its own tax returns to tell, you know, U.S. people what taxes they owe or whatnot. So there are like huge implications um, depending on how people interact with each other on chain. Right. So in, in, I guess we'll, you know, use the the entity analysis. But before we get into sort of thinking of of these vehicles in crypto um, and, and and analogizing them to existing entities, so appropriate analogizing potentially, I'd, I'd like to sort of start by basing it with, you know, everybody, even if you're not a tax lawyer, generally knows that partnership flows through corporation tax at the entity level. There's these LLCs, which is our sort of a different creature, but they're actually, they haven't been around for all that long, uh, like, you know, a few decades. Um, but, but let's just stay with corporations and partnerships and talk about why corporations and partnerships are taxed the way that they are. Yeah. So I, I would say that they're, they're, sort of a couple of principles here that, you know, we want to keep in mind. Um, so number one, uh, just historic, it's just a historic principle, which is historically, you, you know, this country has always had uh, what we call a, a classical corporate tax system. And what does that mean? It means that, like, if you take advantage of the country's sort of legal structures in a way to create, you know, a joint venture that is like liquidly traded, you know, publicly traded joint venture, then generally you, that entity has to pay its own tax, its own corporate tax. And Congress doesn't really care if that entity is wholly owned by U.S. people who are going to pay tax on the dividends when the profits are eventually dividends to them anyway. Congress also says like, yeah, but this is a separate person for tax purposes. And even if it's really just represented by a slip of paper in someone's desk, you know, like some corporate charter, we're imposing corporate tax on that. So that's just a historical perspective that like the corporate tax has always been part of our tax system, at least, you know, since the early 20th century. And um, the government has a vested interest in protecting that because that's a huge portion of our tax revenues as a country. Okay. The other two principles are are sort of these general principles that I think are are worth you know a someone new to you know to tax uh, like most of your listeners I assume just keeping in mind. And um, number one is that U.S. people, U.S. taxpayers, have to pay tax currently on 
their share of you know any income or gain that they realize in the year. And, and that's, I'll unpack that a tiny bit. But um, what I mean by that is like if I hold property, right, and the property is appreciated, like investment property, like stock or or crypto or whatever, and I sell it this year um, at a gain, I have to pay tax on that gain, right? That seems seems sort of obvious, but like you take. Congress takes that and the IRS takes that uh, kind of to an extreme in that, like, like, let's say alternatively that I am the hedge fund Renaissance Technologies. Um, I, Renaissance, I, I'm using a real example. Renaissance Technologies um, hired uh, financial institutions, um, allegedly, and uh, paid them this contractual payment. Uh, in order for those financial institutions to trade a bunch of stocks and securities on its behalf, okay? And Renaissance Technology took the position that um, because they didn't directly hold the stuff, because like financial institutions held that stuff for them, they didn't actually have any tax, right? Because like they, they, they basically owned the single contract, the single investment contract that they had entered into with all these financial institutions. At the end of last year, Renaissance settled for like seven billion dollars or something with the irs because the irs asserted and renaissance technologies lawyers apparently you know agreed at least on some level that because those stocks and securities were being traded for renaissance renaissance was really the owner and was really recognizing all that income and gain currently they couldn't defer it okay so so that's like that's like principle number two, that U.S. people, if stuff is being traded by them or for them, they have to recognize income today. They can't they can't defer that and treat their sort of indirect claim as some kind of like long term capital asset. Number three, the, the last of these three principles is that any U.S. business profits, so any profits derived from like feet on the ground in the U.S., you know, like a U.S. business lemonade stand or banking or, you know, asset management or whatever, um, those business profits also have to be taxed to, uh, to someone on a current basis, okay? So, so what I mean by that is like, let's say that a foreign person, like a, a per, a, you know, we, we say foreigners, it's not intended to be derogatory, that's actually the, the tax term, um, non-US people, a non-US person. Some foreigners will, would consider being a US person derogatory. And, but yeah, ex 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 there you go. <laughs> well, a foreigner hires me in the US and, and I set up a lemonade stand for them. Or like more realistically, I set up a trading business for them and, and I'm doing a bunch of trading on their behalf in the US, boots on the ground in the US. Those, you know, absent some statutory exception are US business profits and the foreigner then is gonna have to pay US taxes on their income from it because those are US business profits taxed currently. So those are sort of the three things to, to keep in mind with the tax system. Great, and, and you know, to kind of build on, on the theory and I think it's important for the deemed analysis um, even though deemed entity analysis, even though it may seem a little basic, is is you know the underpinnings of why corporates are taxed as separate entities, whereas partnerships are passed through. And I think the obvious, but just to restate it, because I think it is important in the analysis, is that because you're a corporation, you get certain privileges, you get certain benefits that you don't get as a partnership. One is this notion of limited liability. Now, LLC sort of bridge that gap, and that's a kind of a, a different animal, but similar. It's like it has the benefits of both. But, you know, whereas a partnership, you don't have that because the individual partners are, you know, at least there's a general partner that is liable. So that's the trade off. So on the one hand, you get the benefit. If you're in a partnership, you get the pass through. So I only get taxed once. But if you're a corporation, you have limited liability. And of course, you also have the ability possibly to get lower taxes and to reinvest in, and not have to pay it at the income level. So there's benefits also for holding it in a corporate level. And it also kind of shields you depending on your tax liability in yeah. other jurisdictions. It, it actually, so, so, so you've just combined like all three principles that, that I just discussed. So, so, you know, number one, this sort of historic preference for corporate tax. Num number two, this idea that U.S. people are taxed currently. Um, and then number three, this idea that U.S. business profits have to be taxed to some how did you combine them? Well, basically what you're saying and what, what's correct is like, look, if you, Eric and I, Jason, collectively decide to set up a business, um, you know, 
Con Congress gives us a little bit of leeway and says, oh, okay, guys, like you're a small business. You can be a partnership if you want. Um, but that means that you each have to report in income currently your your share of the partnership's income. So, so like if the partnership earns 10 bucks and then you collectively decide to redeploy that 10 bucks into another investment, we don't really care that you don't have the cash. You still have to pay tax on that 10 bucks. So your tax currently even though you know you haven't actually disposed of your partnership interest um but you know congratulations we're not imposing an entity level tax okay the alternative is um if you and i decide well we'd really love to like raise a bunch of money from all sorts of people all over the world um then we might choose instead a corporate form or or we might be forced into choosing a corporate form um and in that case, the corporation would be a U.S. corporation subject to tax currently on its income, right? Like a separate person subject to tax. And we could we could then admit foreign, you know, foreign people as shareholders and, and have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of shareholders uh, who aren't taxed currently, but the corporation is, right? So the corporation is then a U.S. taxpayer paying taxes on its income. And then, of course, if it ever dividends out that income, we're subject to tax again. So the, those are the sort of two, two, you know, frameworks for dealing with income. Right. So, so, um, and, and so now I'm going to take another step in, in, towing into the water because I, I want to make <laughs> sure that we set the, the, the groundwork for what we're going to dive into because it's, I, it's intriguing, but I also want to make sure people follow you. Typically I tell my listeners, I'm like, I don't, you know, it's fine. I, you know, try to listen, you're good. You can handle it. And I just we we go into it, but on this one, I'm I'm just I want to make sure because there's, there's there's some very important points here. So, um, let's talk uh, a little bit about so there again with this this notion of a deemed entity. So we use entities to sort of analogize that tax treatment, and maybe to just start off, we'll we'll, we'll take an easy bite and we'll say, where where does well maybe it's not. Maybe it's not where the deemed entity analysis does not apply, but where um, for those instruments where we're not going to say that they're deemed entities, yeah. uh, namely like if ETH, yeah. BTC, and let's talk about that a little bit, and then we'll we'll, we'll start to get into the yeah yeah, yeah yeah yeah. So so let's talk, like let's talk about that. So so you know there are some assets that you can acquire that clearly don't. Or maybe not so clearly, but but you know that I think clearly don't put you into you know a joint venture for profit with other people. Like you acquire these assets, and it's it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for the government to argue that you're somehow you know cooperating with others to earn a pooled profit and to pool your expenses. And two such assets are you know ether and. Bitcoin, right? Those, those look kind of like, I, you know, no one really knows what they are for tax purposes, but, the, you know, but, but most tax lawyers will tell you they're probably commodities for tax purposes, um, treated, you know, similarly to other fungible commodities like oil or gas or gold or silver um, in that, you know, you, you buy them and when you sell them, you know, as an individual, you're just you're taxed on your capital gains or losses, um, and and that's that's sort of it. They're they're like they're fairly boring uh, in that sense, um, fairly simple as well. Right, and and I guess for foreigners too, um, you, you know, because as we start to talk about a deemed entity analysis, we'll probably shift between U.S. persons and foreigners, yeah. and as as for the listeners, as you get through it. You'll understand why we're layering that concept. Yeah. So in. for foreigners, um, you know, I, I mentioned that if a foreigner hire, so foreigners doing stuff on their own, you know, in their own country, the U.S. does not assert jurisdiction over them. Okay, and that that makes sense. It's just sensible. The IRS is never going to be able to touch some person in France acting solely out of France, right? However, as I mentioned before. A foreigner might choose to hire a U.S. asset manager, and and in my you know in, in my practice, I, I represent a lot of you know hedge funds and private equity funds managed by people who are in the U.S. and you know they're they're managing money on behalf of foreigners. So let's say a foreigner hires an asset manager to trade ETH and BTC on their behalf. In that case, the the foreigner might very well be deemed to be in a U.S. business. That's actually a term of art um, because of the manager's U.S. business, the, the business of trading 
ETH and BTC. And then there's a question, is the foreigner subject to US tax? Now, thankfully for us, there is a statutory exemption that says that trading stocks, securities, or commodities for your own account is not a US business if you're a foreigner. So we we try to sort of, you know, um, we try to force ETH and BTC into the commodities, uh, you know, definition for this purpose to be able to conclude um, that, you know, that, that an asset manager can trade ETH and BTC on behalf of a foreigner um, without causing the foreigner to be subject to US tax. Uh, that, that, I think, is an easy analysis when it comes to ETH and BTC, because we have like futures traded that, <laughs> that, that reference ETH and BTC, um, which sort of tends to prove for tax purposes, at least, that they're commodities. It's a lot harder when you get to other types of tokens that don't have futures traded for them. All right. So um, what about uh, tokens that resemble um, like Solana or SHIB? Yeah. So, so uh, you know, there it really... And I'm putting them in, I'm not putting them in the same bucket. <laughs> I'm putting them in separate <laughs> buckets for the You're listeners. You're going to get a lot of Solana Maxi hate now, <laughs> yeah. uh, today. Um, yeah. So, so I like, I, look, I, th this is, this is sort of a practical analysis and, and for my, you know, practical judgment, I, I would say it would be very difficult and problematic from a policy perspective for the for the government to say BTC and ETH are commodities that are entitled to the securities commodities trading safe harbor, but Solana is not, right? It's, li it's, it's intended to be virtually the same thing. It's a layer one token um, with money-like properties, um, you know, consensus layer, and uh, the fact that there aren't futures uh, that explicitly reference Solana, um, I, I think is not sufficient to make Solana sort of different enough from B BTC and ETH to be kicked out of the commodities trading safe harbor. Uh, Shiba Inu is an interesting example, um, is an interesting like step along the spectrum because there it's something that's sort of intended to be fungible, intended to be money-like, but is not a consensus layer token. So, so it does have properties that are fundamentally different from BTC and ETH, which are sort of like base, you know, baseline commodities. I, I would still say that, you know, for what it's worth, SHIB is probably a commodity for purposes of the safe harbor. Um, frankly, I don't, I don't know how many asset managers are trading Shiba Inu on behalf of, uh, you know, on behalf of foreign whales, but yeah. <laughs> it, it, it shares a bucket with some others yeah. uh, of similar nature. Um, and what about uh, stable coins? Yeah, so stable coins are interesting. I, I mean, if you have a stable coin that is, you know, that tracks the U.S. dollar and does so, uh, you know, well, uh, not not all of them do very well. But uh, if, if it if it does a good job at it, then it doesn't really matter, right? Because if you if you sell something worth a dollar, like you don't, you're not going to have any gain or loss. Um, however, uh, what about stable coins that reference you know other currencies? I would say those are probably commodities for purposes of the trading safe harbor. There's a lot of um, th there there's a lot of uh, guidance suggesting that foreign currencies, like the actual underlying foreign currencies, are commodities. So, you know, by analogy, you know, you sort of have to think that a foreign currency backed stablecoin is either a commodity or maybe a security, like in that, you know, it's sort of a deemed stock in like a money market fund or something. Excellent. So, and, and what about, um, you know, we talked a little bit about NFTs, but where they're isn't a communal, um, yeah. you know, treasury. It's like an NFT in the, you know, in the, maybe the, like your shirt. You yeah, know, yeah, your... yeah, yeah. So, so uh, my shirt actually includes a communal treasury. So, so that's sort of interesting, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so NFTs are, raise a really interesting question for U.S. taxpayers um, and, and foreigners for that matter. So for U.S. taxpayers, um, uh, we're subject to a normal, 20%, you know, long-term capital gains rate, right? Which is a preferential rate, you know, our individual rates for like short-term and for ordinary income go up to 39%, right? Um, uh, even high, you know, even higher when, um, when you include the Medicare tax. Uh, for collectibles, the rate, the long-term capital gains rate goes up to 28%. So all other things being equal, I would generally prefer something to not be a collectible than to be a collectible if I want to hold it for over a year. Now, unfortunately, the term collectible is not well defined in the tax code. So a collectible includes um, any work of art, okay, 
and any, quote, other, close quote, tangible property specified by the IRS. So a lot of people look at the word other, other tangible property, and they say, wait a second, um, that other suggests that to begin with, you don't have a collectible unless it's tangible. Right. Because because it ends the list and, it, and it's like other tangible property. OK, so none of this is, you know, none of this is collectible. Um, right. I happen to think that that's sort of an aggressive view. I, I, I don't I think Congress just wasn't really thinking about. Uh, <laughs> no, <and> just, stop. <laughs> believe it or not, you know, uh, it's, it's possible that they weren't considering uh, blockchain based tech when they wrote the collectible <laughs> section. Um, there is an alternative argument, though, like even if you think that, you know, collectibles might include um, intangibles, you might conclude that like my crypto is not a work of art. You know, and uh, all, all deference to, you know, the artist Gremlin, you know, I, I suspect that people are not reporting Pokemon cards as collectibles, even though like they literally are collectibles, just, you know, colloquially. I think for tax purposes, people probably say work of art means work of art. Like if you look at, you know, Merriam-Webster, it'll define work of art as like a work of fine painted, you know, fine arts, sculpture, painting, etc. And arguably like a profile pic doesn't cut it. Um, but look, really, you know, really interesting questions. I actually write about this in an article that's coming out on Thursday for the Bankless Down newsletter, um, you know, considerations for investing in collectibles. So uh, feel free to, you know, pick that up. For, for foreigners, the question becomes, you know, can a foreigner hire a U.S. person uh, or, or, you know, multiple U.S. people to trade collectibles on their behalf? And that actually is a really good question that I don't really have the answer to. Because collect because like because like collectible NFTs, um, whether or not they're collectibles for tax purposes, they're they're not commodities, right? <laughs> like like cryptos are not commodities under under like any understanding of that term. So you know if a foreigner hires you know let's say a foreigner invests in a DAO or invests in a partnership or or hires a U.S. asset manager directly, and you know the managers there, the the decision makers are in the U.S. and doing a bunch of trading of like PFPs and other NFTs, there's a possibility that that would cause the foreigner to become subject to U.S. tax. If they're in a trading business and they're not protected by the commodities or security safe harbor. Interesting. And, you, you know, on the whole notion of collectible and works of art, you, you know, you start to get into some line drawing, right? Because, you know, if you look at people on the one hand, would you say that that's not a work of art? Right. I think people would say, the IRS would say like, uh, what are you kidding me? <laughs> and maybe there's an element of how much you spend on it that would sort of in, be indicative that it's a work of art. And then you get into things like crypto punks, you know, is that a work of art? I mean, it's certainly... You know, I think some people I think there's a strong argument on each side, but for sure, you know, sure. and I, I would yeah. say I, I personally in my personal taxes, like if I if I sold, you know, one of one of my like art bo blocks curated pieces or something um, at a long term gain, I would probably report it as a collectibles game because like those are you know they're intended to be viewed as works of art. All right. That's helpful. All right. And that concludes our deemed entity analysis. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, so, so we, we now, we, we covered what was not, and now we, we get into, uh, what, you know, what is likely to be deemed a, a an entity for the purposes of the tax. And I guess before even diving into this, we have to ask, you know, well, we, we talked a little bit about why it matters, right. Or maybe you can expand, uh, expand on that a little bit, and then we will sort of ask a few other questions before we get into the analysis. Yeah. Yeah. So, so actually let's take, let's, let's take like a, you know, a PFP project, for example, because I think it's a, it's a good way to, uh, to sort of conceptualize this to begin with. Um, and and we, we could even take a PFP project like, like Cryptodes. Okay. So, you know, in Cryptodes, uh, you know, we're all, we're all buying these, these toads, right. And then at, with every sale, um, uh, some amount of royalty. I don't know what I don't remember what it is. Let's say five percent of the sale price uh, get goes to seed an on-chain treasury, and that treasury is not really you know legally owned by anyone, but it's there. And then the the to the owners of the PFP collectively get to vote on how that treasury is deployed. 
So they sort of have control over the treasury. And then um, usually like some founders in the projects, uh, you know, hold a multi-sig that actually has access to the treasury. And they basically like pinky swear <laughs> to um, to deploy the treasury in accordance with the votes, right? That, that's like sort of your, your very standard kind of investment DAO, it, you know, it, or, or other structure. It might, um, you know, in the case of many PFP projects, uh, the structure might not sort of self-identify as a DAO, but it's effectively a DAO, right? It's this decentralized autonomous organization that's voting on how to deploy profits. Now, if you stop there, normal tax principles, just view that as a, you know, as an entity. It's a bunch of people who are collectively, you know, earning profit and sharing it in some way. The sharing, it doesn't need to be through distribution. It can be through, you know, just sort of collective, you know, decisions on how to deploy that profit. Um, uh, and they're also sort of, you know, to the extent that there are expenses, they're sharing those. You might, you might not realize it, but like if someone, you know, turned around and uh, said, hey, like the crypto did me wrong, I'm suing the treasury or something. You know, you, you'd find you. We don't have these cases yet. We don't have this case law. But I think you you could very well find you know a, a court case where like someone on behalf of the treasury, on behalf of the DAO or whatever, is sort of representing the interests of that treasury. Uh, you know, in the face of some plaintiff, you know, suing for monetary damages. That looks a lot like an entity. And then there are questions, um, and and I think these questions are are both you know, legal and regulatory. And that like, the, you, you know, we have questions that deal with sort of personal liability um, and tax and, and, and many of them, you know, overlap. So for tax purposes, the question will be, you know, what type of entity do we have um, and who are its members? Okay. And, and like one, one possibility, let's say in the case of, you know, in the case of this, you know, uh, th this this hypothetical that I created loosely based on cryptodes, you know, one possibility is that all of the cryptodes members are partners in a partnership because we all have like an equal vote on how the treasury is deployed. An alternative argument is that the only partners are really the multi-sigs because ultimately they can sort of go rogue and, and ignore the community's wishes and deploy the treasury as they wish. But in either of those circumstances, likelihood is that the IRS, if they thought about it, would say that, you know, whoever the partners are, they're each taxed currently on their share of the treasury's income, which means that every time that there's a royalty credited to that chain, like each of the five multi-sigs or each of the, you know, 6,969 toads have to include, you know, a fractional like in income, a fractional piece of that royalty as ordinary income, as if they were getting it directly, just like they were Renaissance technologies. And what about if it's taxing the multi-sigs? Does that also mean that it tax the 6,600? Yeah, I, I, that? Think, I, I right. forget the number, but it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> sixes and nines 69, in there. 69, 69, everything has to be a meme. Um, yeah, if, if it's if it's the multi-sigs are the members, are the, are the partners, then they're each taxed on, you know, if there's five multi-sigs, they'd each be taxed on one fifth of the income as it's coming in versus, you know, if, if it's like, if all of the toads are the members, then each one of them would be taxed on one, divided by 69.69 of each dollar that comes in. And then for the the one over 69.69, they only pay gains, they don't pay income uh, in that case? Yeah, yeah, so, so they, would, they would pay, like they would pay, um, you mean if they were members, if they were like partners? Yeah, they're members, but underneath your scenario, if the multi-sigs are viewed as the partners, then yeah, what if, is the ultimate tax consequence of sixty nine sixty nine? So, so if the if the if the multi sigs are viewed as the partners and like the toads are not the partners, <clears throat> then the toads probably own just just some property, right? Like the, then I would just say my toad is just is just a picture. It's either collectible for tax or it's just a regular capital asset for tax, and that way I'm not subject to pass through taxation. But there is an entity there, right? Like anytime there's a shared treasury um, for U.S. tax purposes, at least you know, under current law, there's an entity and you have to decide who the, what kind of entity and who the members of the entity are. All right. So before we start to dive into that, um, you know, what, so, so we're going down the rabbit hole of, of one type of analysis. And before we do that, I kind of want to make sure, like we talked about 
why a little bit um, in terms of the, the context for it. And we talked a little bit about the easy ones, which, you know, they're commodities, they're securities, they're, they have an, ex- an exception from being treated as an entity. Um, why is that analysis appropriate? In other words, you know, is there a specific, are there specific cases that have come out? Is there specific guidance? Like, you know, in, in other words, what you're saying, you know, th- that type of analysis is logical, but just because it's logical doesn't mean it's the correct analysis. And I just want to understand a little bit, you know, wh- why that is the appropriate analysis to, yeah. to follow. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I mean, the tax law has a hair trigger for deemed entity. Like, you know, the, the regulations literally say, you know, um, any arrangement or course of dealing, you know, uh, uh, any joint venture for profit, whether or not incorporated, is a deemed entity. And and the why, you could think of it as like, let's say you and I set up a lemonade stand and we, you know, we each, you know, we, we each put a hundred bucks in, you know, to, to set up the stand and the stand start, you know, and the stand uses that hundred dollars to buy lemons, you know, we, we hire some some kid at minimum wage to sell lemons, right? And and we each have, you know, one stock, one share of stock in this lemonade stand. Um, and the lemons start getting sold. Um, we could, if we were sort of crypto native, maybe we would say, oh, look, each of us only has one share and the share never changes. It's like this tokenized interest in this lemonade stand. So the lemonade stand is earning all this income, but we're not going to report it currently. We're just going to, we're just going to hold our shares. And like this, the treasury in the lemonade stand is going to build, 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 build. Hopefully, you know, there's going to be a lot of dollars in that eventually. And then I can sell my share of stock for more than what I put in, right? More than my hundred dollars and claim a long-term capital gain. That's just not how the tax law is intended to work. The tax law would say, like, no, you know, you guys are indirectly earning this income currently. Again, it's sort of like the, the you know, one of the fundamental principles that I laid out earlier. Like, if we own a share of the lemonade stand, we own a share of that lemonade stand's income, if it's a partnership. Or the lemonade stand is a separate taxpayer. It's a corporation and it has to pay tax on that, you know, on those business profits. And again, it's it's sort of like this elegant solution to ensure that U.S. business profits are always subject to tax in someone's hands. Right. It can't be it can't be deferred and it can't be converted from ordinary income into long term capital gains. All right, so I, I'm going to hate myself for doing this. I'm going to go down the lemonade stand road, but Let's and then it. hopefully we'll just get back to 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 something uh, more grounded. <laughs> so, so taking the lemonade stand, let's say that um, a bunch of boys and girls doesn't matter come upon this lemonade stand, and there are lemons laying all over the ground. Now you got to work with me on analogies, please. So, um, <laughs> and they each grab this lemon. This, this lemon, the lemons on the ground and this lemonade stand on its own. It just starts to work. It's amazing. It's like, it just starts creating and it starts generating this lemonade and people come up and they're like, Oh my God, I can just take the lemonade and I give it a coin and it gives me money. <laughs> and it's got this inherent self-managing treasury, right? So obviously I'm making the analogy to the down. The people yeah. are just on the side saying, yeah, I got this lemon. I don't really know what it is. I know I got it near the lemonade stand, you know? So the point, the point obviously I'm making is in that case, there's an argument that like, hey, I'm actually not part of that lemonade making machine that's managing the money. And like, the crazy thing is, I'm just, I'll take a little bit of stuff and then I'll pull back. I swear. I promise I'll pull back. <laughs> it's like when it runs out of lemonades, it instantly sends a, no- a notification to the store. You know, Mr. Wilson comes up with his crate of lemons, drops it, and it has arms that grabs it, throws it back. I, 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 this yeah. is a no. serious podcast, this everybody. Is is serious great. podcast. <laughs> and the lemons are being tossed into the thing, and Mr. Wilson's paid, and he goes back, and everybody's everything. And the people are just saying, by going, like, I got a lemon. That's it. What, what, what do you have? I have a lemon too. Oh, okay. Oh, look, I got two lemons. How'd that happen? Right? I don't know. So, that case, it, you know, is that is that does the deemed entity analysis work? I have this lemonade stand 
again, I, I we have to the analogies are I'm struggling with a little bit on on how they got the lemon to begin with, I, but no, it all works on its own. I you know? Eric, I I love this because I think you're going you're, you're sort of skipping to really my conclusion, which my my sort of policy <laughs> conclusion, which is that like no like the current tax rules don't work for on-chain activities um you know ethereum is a programmable substrate for human coordination right that's sort of like the, the axiomatic at this point you hear it all the time and it's really true we have this way of you know of, of programming human coordination across the globe among humans who don't know each other's identities, right? It's all pseudonymous. The tax law always assumes that if you're dealing with people in the ordinary course, you know who they are so that, you know, parties can collectively deputize someone to, you know, pay taxes if they're like representing a corporation, for example, or to file information returns to allow the you know, the shareholders, the members, the partners to pay their taxes directly in the case of an entity that's treated as a partnership. And the tax law just frankly falls apart when you have people dealing pseudonymously across borders in ways that look like, you know, traditional entities, right? Arrangements that look like traditional entities for U.S. tax purposes. And frankly, we just don't have a framework for thinking about those, you know, those arrangements under current law. And you might say, okay, fine. So, so like, let's wipe our hands of it then. Let's just say in that case that like any token that would, you know, ordinarily just be treated as an interest in a partnership or an interest in a corporation, you know, because Jason is old school and he grew up like in, in the, you know, in TradFi, you know, he's just thinking about this wrong. Let's just treat all those tokens as just like capital assets, end of story. Um, I think that that might be an argument to make, but then you really have to develop that with, with policymakers because number one, you're basically saying, kill the corporate tax, right? I, I mean, you're basically saying, okay, we're gonna reimagine our entire financial system and in a way that allows people to effectively just elect out of current taxation of business profits. And, and again, that might be fine, but it, 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 in that case, it requires an actual change in law to effectuate it, right? Like, like you can't, you know, the IRS is not going to be happy to just say, okay, we now have this new class of instrument that allows people to avoid, you know, current taxation of U.S. business profits. Um, um, oh, yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have a better answer than that, really. In the meantime, okay. we're sort of forced to, I think, think creatively and, and unfortunately kind of like post hoc often, um, um, like try to cram what we understand, uh, you know, these current relationships that exist on Ethereum and on other smart contracts platforms into these old cubby holes that were designed uh, by, you know, policymakers who had no idea what blockchain technology did or was capable of. All right. So with that, maybe maybe we should begin. And, and I guess maybe even, you know, like many things with tax, it's like you want to begin and then you're like, well, hold it. There's these two other considerations as well. So um, or <laughs> if there were only two. So <laughs> the, the U.S. corporation, um, you know, if it's treated like a U.S. corporation, that's simple. You know, I don't, I'm not saying it's simpler, but you have a U.S. corporation, you have a U.S. partnership. But then you also have this a foreign corporation, and because digital assets aren't necessarily confined to a single country, um, that's that has, you know, there's some I guess good things from a tax perspective to it. Yeah, there are some things that people need to be aware of from a U.S. tax perspective. Uh, um, and so maybe even before we still we're we're on, we're in yeah. 42 minutes, we're still getting to the deem entity analysis. I think we're we're covering yeah, it. Yeah, we're, we're, this is good. This is good. Uh, um, <laughs> so 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 you know, let's talk about you know. So there's there's the entity classification itself. There's the U S foreign classification. Let's break down maybe a couple of the, couple of the issues that that you know. If you're a foreign corporation, name the foreign corporation what it means for the the U S holders. Yeah. 
So, so, um, so, right. If you're a U.S. corporation, if some if some arrangement is a U.S. corporation, it just owes corporate tax. Okay. So, so, like, let's put that aside. That might be, you know, that might be something that you elect to structure into. Occasionally, it makes sense. Frankly, a lot of DAOs, um, like uh, I believe Friends with Benefit is an example. Um, they structure themselves just as domestic corporations pay U.S. tax on their profits, and then they can do stuff in the U.S. and they can admit foreign holders and they don't really have to worry about, you know, about restricting ownership or anything because, look, there's a taxpayer like the IRS has a taxpayer to go after if they need, you know, if they need to collect their, you know, their their um, sort of share their piece of the pie. Um, a foreign corporation is a little more dangerous from the you know, from the FISC's perspective, right? Because a foreign corporation, one that's not organized in the U.S., by default is not subject to U.S. tax. And that, you know, that obviously makes um, government officials nervous um, if the foreign corporation is engaged in a U.S. business. So Congress, you know, according to, to statute, um, provided that foreign corporations that are engaged in a U.S. business are subject to U.S. tax, just like U.S. corporations. It's actually worse. They're subject to tax plus um, a 30% branch profits tax on the after-tax amount. It makes it like it makes it just stupid to set up a foreign corporation if you're going to be doing primarily U.S. business stuff. Um, so, so that's number one. Number two is Congress said, "Oh, but what if Jason um, and Eric and a bunch of other you know U.S. people?" set up a Cayman entity that like just buys a bunch of stock and securities, you know? So, so like we, again, we want to, we want to continue to ensure that U S people are taxed currently um, on income, especially income that can kind of easily be moved offshore. So another rule for foreign corporations is even if they're not in a U.S. business, if they hold too much passive stuff, U S people are just taxed on a pass-through basis. It's called, um, it's called the Passive Foreign Investment Company Rules or PFIC Rules, um, which are kind of a nightmare, like a nightmare for people. Basically, if I own stock in a PFIC, I'm subject to horrible, onerous tax penalties unless I make an election to include an in income currently, my share of the PFIC's income, which means that the PFIC has to report like it's pass-through income over to me. So that, uh, again, assumes centralization at the corporate layer. And and then there's also uh, CFC, Control Foreign Corporations, that has its own... Uh... Uh, it's, it's, it gets even worse. So so like, yeah, so, so PFIX are sort of, you know, any tiny shareholder um, that owns stock in a foreign corporation that does too much passive stuff has to elect pass-through tax. And then any big shareholder, like any you know, 10% shareholder in a corporation that's controlled by U.S. people is automatically subject to pass through tax. Those two regimes kind of overlap with each other. Yeah. And, and both of these, you know, for anybody who's structuring uh, deals with foreign companies, um, you know, you do any kind of acquisition deal, you, you can spend a lot of time talking PFIC and CFC. Uh, it comes up and, and, you know, when things change, even post acquisition, you know, you start getting a lot of accountants in the room and, and paying very close attention to it and saying, OK, what activity are you doing? <laughs> and, and you know, I mean, sometimes it, it's pass through is fine, uh, but, you know, a lot of it goes through. I mean, you know, particularly for smaller entities, um, it can be very onerous or retail investors. It can be very onerous for like, um, you know, I'm not going to say it's easy for venture firms, but oftentimes, you know, depending on the type of entity, they could have a lot of experience dealing with PFIX. And so it's sort of a, an operating cost, if you would. But, uh, you know, if, if it's not something that you do every day, and particularly as a retail investor, it's it's daunting. Uh, there's different things you can do from a tax situation. This this podcast isn't about um, PFIC mitigation. Um, and, and I don't think uh, I'd, I'd have the same number of listeners at the end of the podcast if I started to getting into PFIC mitigation. Um, but... Um, but yeah, so 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 ultimately, what is the best, uh, you know, tax outcome for a crypto project um, that falls within this deemed entity analysis? Yeah. So the best, so the best treatment that we can hope for, uh, not always doable, is to treat the deemed entity as a foreign corporation that's not in a U.S. business and is not a PFIC or a controlled foreign corporation. 
And, and the reason being that then, you know, number one, the entity is not subject to U.S. tax, right? Because it's a foreign corporation and is not in a U.S. business. And then number two, um, U.S. taxpayers are not subject to pass through taxation because it's a foreign corporation, not a partnership and because it's not a PFIC or a controlled foreign corporation. So, so you end up having, you know, stock in a foreign corporation that's just like a capital asset. And then, then you get to say like, oh, great, I just have this capital asset, there's no pass through taxation, and the, the underlying entity doesn't owe US tax. That's basically the position we take for like, all of our, you know, tokens, um, or I, I shouldn't say that out loud, I guess, but that's the, that's the position most US taxpayers take for tokens, um, that they're just sort of this undifferentiated property. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, unfortunately, it does require some sort of uh, post hoc reasoning to get there, I think. But I think it's also logical. Like, uh, you know, if you have an investment DAO that's offshore, um, OK, that's probably that's probably passive income. Right. So you probably have that problem, you know, or you do a, 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 you own a, a, a securitization vehicle. You know, and you're getting I mean, that's, you know, that's passive income. But, you know, if it's an, you know, if it's in if it has operating income, um, you know, that's that's sort of the magic test. Like, you know, you can't you, you know, and that's why yes. sometimes when you structure these things, you make sure on, on offshore, you're not creating like these these nested companies, you know, where one is a holding company because then the holding company gets that pass through. Yeah. And now you're now it's passive. So you're like, no, I got to connect it to the operating entity. So it's it's not a passive entity. Exactly. It, it, so so where this starts, like where this starts kind of to, you know, where the rubber hits the road really is drawing that distinction that, that you're kind of making. Is it, it's like, you know, is the thing that we're creating on chain, does it look more like a traditional entity where like there's a real, you know, we think that there's a real risk that the government will come after us and say, hey, there should be pass through tax here or there should be entity level tax here. Right. Or do you think that you can ha you can make a fairly strong argument that like, no, this is really just like some piece of property and and implicitly what the argument you're making there is this piece of property is a foreign corporation stock that's not engaged in the u.s business and is not a p-fix so there's no pass-through taxation i'm just trying to sort of like create the mental frameworks for for you know for distinguishing between those two types of projects right and so now to start to get into it a little bit more um you know we're we're, we're going to start to talk about like different types of tokens and what analysis it would fall into, di different types of DAOs and what deemed entity analysis it would, it would fall into. And, and also, um, I think we touched on NFTs uh, a bit and in, in the differences between them um, and what entities they would fall, what deemed entity analysis they would fall into. But, uh, um, you know, since, we, since I just uh, talked a little bit about the investment DAO, um, let's talk about, let's take an example of an investment DAO that collects NFTs. Okay. So, so like, so start small, right. And, and let's say, you know, let's say like you and me and a, you know, bunch of our lawyer friends, uh, get together and we decide to each put in, you know, a hundred bucks worth of ether into a, you know, a, a multi-sig in exchange or a Gnosis safe, right. In exchange for tokens, right. And those tokens represent, you know, a flat voting in, you know, whatever that, that like, you know, multi-sig invests in, right? And, and we decide that we want that multi-sig to invest in NFTs. Um, so I, I would say that that looks a lot like a traditional collective investment vehicle. Like, you know, take the chain out of it. And, you know, particularly since we all know each other, like, it kind of feels like we're just in a partnership, like an investment partnership. And, and I would say that there's a high, high probability that the IRS, that's the, the view that the IRS would take. Meaning that, you know, absent any sort of special tax planning, assuming that we're, you know, under 100 people, um, and I'll explain why in a minute, um, we're, our partnership is... Yeah, our, our entity is probably a partnership. It's required to file annual tax returns reporting, you know, its income and gain. It doesn't have to pay entity level tax, but it has to give us each 
a schedule K1, which is a report that tells us each our share of its income and gain and like items of deduction. And then we have to factor those in to our own taxes when we file our tax returns. Okay. And then, so what about when uh, we, we talked about the hundred yeah. uh, person limitation, which for me has a different meaning because the investment company right. act, right. Right. but, uh, well, I, I guess they're things iterate with each other, right? I, I mean, yeah, I'm sure. I'm yeah, sure it's yeah. not accidental. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what accidental. is the, what is the tax significant? Yeah. Uh, so, tax so, significance? so back in the eighties, um, partnerships became like a big thing. Uh, and, uh, um, I, I, I think the Boston Celtics became a partnership at one point. Uh, maybe maybe you remember this better than than I do. Um, uh, not not to not to be hey hey. <laughs> let's be gentle here. Let's be but, gentle. But you know, like more like my you, Minecraft shirt. Okay, give me a break. <laughs> the proliferation of partnerships made Congress really nervous. They realized that you know unless they acted fast, soon you know IBM and like every other you know entity traded on the New York Stock Exchange could convert into a partnership and avoid corporate level tax that way. So what Congress did is they drew a line. They said, okay, um, if you have like a relatively small group of people, um, we'll let you be a partnership. But if you have more than a hundred partners, uh, so it's like publicly traded at that point, um, and your income is, is uh, is more than 10% active, meaning like you're doing a business, right? Like you're not just sort of like holding, you know, holding stocks and securities or something, but you're you're actually, you know, doing a business such as, you know, possibly regularly trading NFTs. Um, you, uh, you default to corporation. You're, you're treated as a publicly traded partnership, taxable as a corporation. So like even, even though tax law does give you some, you know, ability to elect into different treatments. It also sort of pushes you toward different treatments, depending on some of the facts and circumstances that exist. You realize like how absurd this all is, right? When once you enter the on-chain world, because like be, because the truth is, you know, if if we set up a um, if we set up a you know my hypothetical multisig to invest in NFTs, um, like. One, we have to know literally who everyone is who invests in the thing because we have to be able to give them K-1s, right? Um, number two, we have to actually get representations from them to the effect that each one of them is only one person, right? Because like, what if instead, like, you know, one of the one of the tokens is actually owned by like, you know, a hundred people, like a, a separate multi-sig that itself is owned by a, a hundred people, right? That blows up our tax analysis. It was just like really screwed up. And, and, you know, the tax laws just have not caught up to that, obviously. They, again, they assume that, you know, anytime you're dealing with people, you know who they are. Right. So if it's over 100, then it just becomes it's corporation. You, if it's over 100 and you want like foreigners and you don't want to do regular reporting to people, sometimes you just have to elect a corporation because it's sort of like the best option you have. Um, if you look at, um, not, not, a, not clients of mine, but if you look at like, uh, Flamingo Dow or, um, 6529's fund or whatever, I believe that those, I believe that, um, those are actually structured as like LLCs where the tokens are just, you know, interests in the LLCs and are actually treated as partnership interests and are non-transferable. And each person actually has to sign a rep letter, like saying who they are and that they're not going to transfer because, because otherwise there's just no way to do tax compliance. An alternative way that they could have done it is they could have said, okay, we're just going to elect to be, you know, a Delaware C corporation for us tax purposes, and we're going to pay taxes. And then our tokens are transferable, but there's this like inefficiency embedded in there because, you know, at this centralized entity level, we're actually paying a 21% corporate tax before any profits are even released out to anyone else. Right, right. Although, you know, the corporation probably gets challenging uh, from an investment company analysis perspective as well. And, yeah. and you know, it raises uh, registration implications. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe l l let's talk about something like a, a social club. Yeah, uh, that's doing U.S. events. Yeah, yeah. So right. So so you might you might be listening, or, or you know, and and saying like, wait a second, this is insane. Like you, you know, like 
I can understand, you know, a bunch of people getting together and investing in NFTs together. Like, sure, they should be taxed on their share of profits from that on a current basis, because like, you know, if they if they invested in fine art in the real world, like it would be the same consequence. But like, what if they're just getting together to, you know, improve, you know, improve a protocol or to raise money to give to charity or something? Well, here's the thing. Um, the U.S. doesn't really- Or maybe, or maybe they put their money into it and they they can get a return, but the main purpose is social events. Yeah, right, right, right. Like they want to just host social events. They want to, uh, you know, they want to invite people to whatever, to, to, to like events where they can display friends entities or something. I don't know. Um, that doesn't really feel like a business for profit, right? But the IRS doesn't really care. Like, and Congress doesn't really care. The general rule is that if you come together um, and and collectively earn profits, then you're in a business entity. And that business entity, uh, you know, is either a partnership or a corporation. And if it's a partnership, then you're all taxed on the income. And if it's a corporation, then it's taxed on the income, right? Um, assuming the income is from US, uh, US sources. So one thing that's possible to do and that some social clubs are doing is they're actually forming like an entity, a legal entity. Um, and if if the legal entity is actually charitable, so so the mo the most uh, famous example I think would be the the Big Green, you know, Big Green DAO, which is run by Kimball Musk. Uh, or well, well, Big Green the company is run by Kimball Musk, uh, Elon's brother, and uh, helps you know teach people about, you know, planting gardens and sustainable, you know, sustainable, you know, living and, and whatnot. And Big Green partners up with Big Green DAO. And Big Green is actually a 501c3. It's a charity. Like I can, you know, th their purpose is explicitly permitted as a charitable purpose in the tax code. I can donate money to Big Green 501c3 and take a tax deduction. And Big Green 501c3 doesn't have any, doesn't have to pay corporate income tax, but it does have to file tax returns. And that's one thing I, I actually do at Freed Frank um, pro bono for people. If DAOs want to set up sort of partner 501c3s, we, we do that pro bono um, for the DAOs and the DAO can sort of be kind of like an advisory committee to the 501c3, where the, where the 501c3, this off-chain entity, agrees to act on behalf of the DAO so long as you know, it's consistent with the 501c3's charitable purposes. And that that's like, that's sort of administrative grace that the government provides to, to charities, because basically the idea is, you know, Congress can't do all this stuff alone. If you do something that sort of gives back, you know, to the public benefit, you know, and, and satisfies these requirements, then, you know, we're not going to tax you for that, because that's something that like government ideally sort of would have done for its people anyway. Um, However, most social clubs, <clears throat> they're not charitable. Like, like, you know, normally setting up events and stuff for you know, like-minded individuals is not a charitable purpose. Um, and, and in that case, you can, you can, there's an alternative treatment where you can set up as a, as a 501c7, which is also not subject to uh, income tax, but has other requirements. Like it can't derive too much of its income from non-members. Like most of its income has to come from from uh, membership dues and whatnot. There are these like real requirements. Again, none of this is ideal from the DAO's perspective because it's highly, highly centralized. But it is an option that some DAOs explore um, when centralization is not their you know ultimate goal, um, and they want to have a legally compliant, tax compliant uh, entity. Right. And, and taking advantage of the, some of those uh, exemptions, um, you know, re requires discipline. It's not easily done. No, right. um, and you literally so, need a centralized hub, right? Where, where like some, someone, is, someone is there in the real world filing tax returns and potentially paying taxes. Right. Right. So, so, so now we'll, we'll shift gears to, to uh, maybe a tougher one, which is protocol DAO <laughs> governance tokens. Yeah. So, so like this, this is where we're basically just in the wild west, right? And and like may, maybe the way to start, is, the way to start is actually think about just a smart contract generally, and then and then think about a protocol DAO as sort of governance over 
you know, multiple smart contracts, right? So, so like I, I've actually, I'm writing, I'm writing an article right now for probably next month's, you know, bankless newsletter. And, and uh, uh, so here's my teaser and, and, uh, and this is sort of my framework thinking about this. Um, like think about the, like a curve, you know, curve pool, like the three pool and curve, right? Curve is an automated market maker um, specifically geared towards stable coins. And in the three pool, you know, you have three stable coins, right? DAI, USDC, and USDT. Um, and, and basically on the front end, like traders can come to the pool and, and the pool will quote them algorithmically a price for swapping DAI for USDC or DAI for Tether or, or whatever whatever you have. And the pool earns a fee on every swap, right? And, and that's also all algorithmically, you know, algorithmically quoted. And where does the liquidity come from to do those swaps? Well, it comes from liquidity providers, right? On the on the back end. So, you know, I can contribute those three stable coins into the pool on the back end in exchange for an LP token, a liquidity provider token. And my LP token, just like, you know, your LP token or anyone else's, um, just represents a share of whatever's in the pool, which is like this constantly changing proportions of stable coins um, plus fees. Right. Under normal U.S. tax principles, you, you know where I'm going with this. Um, the LP tokens look like equity in an entity. Right. Because like the three pool is this thing. It's this enterprise that's doing something. This something is, is actually, you know, think about it. It's, it's, it's a bank. It's a dealer. Like th this thing is doing what JP Morgan does on a daily basis. Right. Um, but it's not paying corporate taxes. Um, and the profits are being split by the LP holders, right? Each LP token um, represents a share, hopefully ever growing share of profits. So for tax purposes, um, you know, if you like, if you applied the tax law sort of woodenly to an, you know, to the three pool, you would say, oh shit, the three pool is an entity. The LP tokens are its equity. And you then have to decide, is the entity a domestic corporation? If so, it needs to be paying taxes. And it's clearly not. Um, is it a foreign corporation? You know, presumably that's what people are treating it as. And presumably they're saying it's not in a U.S. business, so it doesn't owe U.S. taxes. And presumably they're saying it's in this like dealer activity that's not generating passive income, it's generating active income, and it's all done offshore so that it's, you know, again, not in the U.S. business and it's not a passive foreign investment company. So that my LP tokens are just stock in a foreign corporation and I, I'm not subject to, you know, pass through tax. Right. And there's there's definitely some strangeness to applying that, particularly to like an AMM yeah. or, or a curve pool, because, you know, if you think about like a corporation or you think even about an LLC, an LP, it's basically, it's like there's a, a, you know, there's a profit and all the members are sharing and they sort of have this cooperative type relationship, if you would. Like they all, there's a bucket, money comes in, I take the pieces out. But in fact, in these pools, that relationship doesn't actually exist. Exactly. Right. It's sort of like taking a big flat balloon and filling it a little bit with water. And, you know, you push here and something pops out there or like a waterbed or whatever. It's like the, the relationship of the, the, the participants in the pool. I mean, you could have participants in a pool whose, whose interests are directly opposed to one another. Yes. And, and, and one person's gain could be another one's loss. So, in, within that pool, there's a there's a whole dynamic marketplace in some ways, shape or form. You could almost argue it's a marketplace, although it's not. The marketplace is really how it phases out. But within the pool, there's dynamics. That's exactly and, right. Yeah. Right. That's exactly right. And and that's sort of the problem, I, I think. Like, that's the heart of the problem. That under traditional tax principles, you have entities kind of everywhere on chain, but like really. That's not how they should be treated because because there's something different about what we're doing here, and that, that's something different is like really we've we've um, sort of uh, we've injected kind of the gig economy into 
entities where now everyone is really acting on their own behalf and more so than like, you know, there are different sh factions or shareholders in a corporation. Like there's, there's something different. It's hard to articulate, but I think you did a good job of it where like right. really everyone views themselves as acting on their own behalf, not on behalf. Well, we, we, but we, we, we liken corporations to persons, but in a pool, what person goes down the street, punching themselves in the nose, tripping, walking into different, like there's nothing, there's no coordinated, coordinated profit purpose exactly. with that entity, right? Exactly. So, now, so now, I probably had it better before. I didn't have to go to punching myself. It just, <laughs> well, I, so, I did the lemonade stand, so I had to kind of tie back to something for people I, who like I, the lemonade it's stand. Good, it's good. You're, you're, do, you're, you're a great uh, tax professor. You're, you're doing great. <laughs> um, no, but, but now, now like take it, you know, take the curve pool and, and, you know, expand this a little. I hope I'm not going to get in trouble. Curve is not a client, by the way. I'm just sort of pulling something, you know. <laughs> um, uh, you know, like continue thinking about this and, and consider the CRV tokens. So like you have these pools and there's sort of these auto executing things that kind of look like corporations for tax purposes. Um, and then you have the CRV token, which itself like, you know, it's it's emitted by the pools, right? And then if if I take my CRV tokens and I lock them up, I, I lock up my CRV token with the Curve protocol, I get some voting rights, right? And I get more more voting rights. I get if I lock up, you know, one one CRV, I get one, you know, VE CRV, vote escrow CRV. If I agree to lock up my CRV for I think four years or something, and if I lock it up for three years, maybe I get you know 0.75 VE CRV, etc. Um, but I get some voting rights, and now as a voter, I get a few things. Number one, I get um, I share more fees, right? I get streaming fees from all of the like curve pools, right? Those go directly to me. They get credited to my um, to my account on Curve. Um, and then number two, um, I get like boosted rewards from the particular pools that I'm providing liquidity to. And then number three, I get to vote on, um, on uh, operation and future proposals for the Curve protocol. Now, explain that to the IRS. And I suspect that even if like some, you know, auditors there or, you know, or higher ups there, uh, could sort of get over the hump of, and and say like okay maybe a, a maybe LP token holders are not equity holders in a company like maybe that's something else I do I, I am concerned that they'll say oh wait but like these curve people like these these VE CRV holders like they're clearly holders in an entity because they're actually like they they have the ability to change the entire protocol. Like any one of them can make a proposal and then they can, they vote on it and they're sharing profits from like the entire protocol that starts looking like you're like multinational company. Right. But at the same time, like it does have a ton of similarities to the smart contract where, you know, notwithstanding that we're sort of all acting in concert at the same time, like in the way you described it, Eric, you know, maybe I'll, I'll let you try it again, but like, <laughs> At the same time, we're sort of not, right? At the same time, like, I, I don't really view myself as a partner with you by virtue of the fact that we might both have curve tokens, right? Right, right. Um, so so it's, I, we're, we're in this, like, really uncharted territory, and I don't know, I, I just frankly don't know how the talk, tax rule will deal with it. On one hand, you might have to say, yeah, the cur like, VE CRV holders are all shareholders in a deemed entity that is what? I, I don't know. I, I mean, a foreign corporation, I guess, that's not engaged in U.S. business. But like, if you're setting up a protocol, um, you might actually want to plan into that treatment because otherwise you're in this real no man's land. And what do I mean by plan into that treatment? Well, if you're like setting up, you know, the next version of Curve Protocol, you might want to take, you, you might want to consider taking measures to ensure that like, it really is not engaged in a U.S. business. Um, how do you do that? Uh, well, maybe like one way is anytime you uh, deploy a contract to the chain, make sure that that contract is not deployed by a U.S. person. Like, I, I don't know. That's really hard. I know when you're when you're like voting in this decentralized way. But if you do have multi sigs, maybe you make sure that like they're not U.S. so that. You know, they're not doing stuff in the U.S. But frankly, I'm just sort of making this stuff up. I don't have clear answers. I just know that this is um, 
potentially like the next tax frontier to be explored um, by the IRS. And yeah, I mean, it, it's the, the complexity there is that by choosing multi-sigs that are in the U.S. or not deploying in the U.S., I mean, if the IRS says, yeah, that's good as long as you do that, that's sort of like, okay, is that what we really right. want to achieve? Is that the yeah, terrible policy? policy. <laughs> is that the policy outcome we want? I mean, there's a lot of policy questions, which both tax and securities obviously raises. And like, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, we set up a foundation structure offshore. You know, we it's maybe it's memberless. We do, you know, we we use the Cayman Foundation structure or similar structures to reflect the fact that it is memberless. These are smart contract governed. It's just, it's not in, there's no evasionary tactic. It reflects the reality of what it is and whether it's Cayman Foundation or otherwise, you know, sure, you don't have to necessarily condone it in the US, so to speak, because, you know, whatever. But the practical matter is, is it's, it is, we are trying to achieve decentral, decentralization and, and it is, it is consistent with what the smart contract does, but but that makes sense. But when you start to get into these these nuances of who can be the multisig or who can be the who can deploy the code, I mean, really, like, oh crap! I'm, I, I had sent, oh no, our tax treatment is destroyed. You know, like, right. oh crap! I I will send you the file. You know, <laughs> and you're in uh, you know India, and then you receive it and you hit send. Oh, yeah. Shoo. We dodged that bullet. Thank God, you know, they oh, right, saved. Right, you know? right, right. No, you're, you're just, you're sort of proving the point that like, that like the current tax rule clearly didn't contemplate this stuff, right? And, and like, right. I, I think we just need new tax law to address this stuff. Unfortunately, um, I'm not optimistic that, you know, this, that most of this can be addressed by like regulation or something, you know, even though I, I have a great deal of respect for a lot of people at Treasury, I, I, you know, what I'm describing is, is really like a change in law issue that would have to be considered. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. I, I mean, it, it makes the, the tax law isn't only kind of impossible to apply to uh, many decentralized uh, relationships, but it also, to the extent you do try to apply it, it, it yields like absurd policy results that, you know, clearly couldn't have been intended by Congress. Um, and, and and the fact of the matter is the, it, it may be that like the guy who hits send instead of like, I meant to send it to India or whatever, it doesn't, whatever, yeah. but I, I meant to send it abroad to my, my partner <laughs> somewhere else, <laughs> you know, just stupid things like that. But yet, yeah. you know, it, sometimes in these scenarios, you know, some people, some entities may get it, may slip up and others may not. And if you're the IRS and you're looking for a head to roll, like which one are you going to point to? You're going to be like, well, you did deploy it in the US. Yeah, but that was an accident. I hit send. I was I was drinking coffee and I was cleaning off my keyboard and I accidentally hit send. You know, it's like, well, you know, that sounds great. But, um, you but, know, what should I have done? You know, the obvious, it, you know. Yeah. And that is, frankly, a huge part of the job of a lawyer at a big law firm, which is sort of ensuring, you know, not, not just tax. Or, or a small law firm. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And, and lawyers, but not on the tax side. Yeah, you know, yeah, we, we say, oh, I want to be middle of the road, right? You, you, I, I don't want to be the low hanging fruit for a regulator. Um, so, you know, even when we're operating in kind of no man's land, you know, we, we try to take reasonable positions um, that, that at least, you know, that at least put us in middle of the road uh, so that, you know, if, if, you know, a regulator does wake up to this and say, oh, you know, like I, <laughs> there's all this there's all this tax revenue that we can grab if we just like make, you know, this particular assertion, you know, that you you fall sort of, you know, slightly to the to one side of that assertion. To, to and so, side. you know, on on this point with the protocol tokens, um, what has your been experience been talking to, to people within the IRS, you know, on behalf of clients, because I'm sure you you seek out guidance and on a no names basis, of course. Um, what has been, I mean, it, it, it you know, it, I'm sure there's a recognition of 
the, you know, some of the challenges in the regulation. And that if you ask for interpretations, they'll say, well, you know, I can't guarantee you, but based on today, you know, I mean, the last thing you want is like a, a formal guidance, right? Then you'll wait two years and your client will want to kill you or whatever. I don't know what the timing is. Uh, you can tell me, but what's been your experience in sort of asking these questions to the IRS, both in the, in the context of formal guidance when necessary um, or, or informal guidance? You are very optimistic. Um, uh, the, 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 I, so I, I've spoken a lot with, uh, with Treasury representatives, and, and I speak on panels regularly. I, I spoke at the American Bar Association tax section meeting uh, a few weeks ago. I'm speaking at the New York State Bar Association tax section summer meeting in a few weeks. Um, you know, both like, you know, government officials attend attend these meetings um they are nowhere near the point at which they are ready to comment on um these sorts of relationships like protocol dow tokens and what they're what they are and and i don't think you know they're they're not even ready to t uh to comment on um uh, like liquidity provider tokens, like, you know, like LP tokens in curve or, or, I, you know, the, the same, by the way, the same, you know, equi or entity type concerns arise for like compound C tokens and Lido, you know, wrapped state teeth, et cetera. Um, not, they're not ready to speak about any of this, uh, unfortunately. And, and, you know, as, as, as smart as they are, um, uh, in particular, I, I would I would give a shout out to, to Erica Ninehouse, who um, is a former practitioner at Cleary. Uh, she really really knows financial products and has uh, you know sort of d done done a lot of thinking. I think while at at the government about digital assets. Um, to me, it seems like like the IRS, you know, notwithstanding those efforts, is still potentially years away from really thinking about these relationships deeply. I mean, look, they can't even decide whether like consensus layer staking rewards are taxable on a current basis yet. Right? I, I mean, I know you had Abe, Abe Sutherland on uh, in a prior podcast and you guys talked about that a lot. Um, I don't know if that was before or after the IRS, you know, gave Jarrett's their um, their refund and then like so before uh, before. Right. So so since then, you know, the IRS refunded them their money and then uh, filed a motion to dismiss so that the IRS wouldn't have to give guidance, right, on whether or not consensus layer staking rewards are taxable currently. That's how far we are. Like, like we're still talking about, you know, base layer, sort of the most basic transaction you can do on Ethereum, right? Yeah, I mean, that that case was amazing because it was like, you know, it came out and everybody's like, yeah, it's like, no, 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 that's... <laughs> right, we have zero they, they are dodging, they are saying, I'm not answering the question today, yeah. okay? Yeah. Now, you now know. I will, I, I will, like you know, um, put out a plug for you know uh, legislators like Senators uh, Gillibrand and Lummis, who uh, you know recently released their their crypto bill, uh, and, and it's it's an effort, um, I think, a pretty darn good effort at a comprehensive uh, you know legislative framework for digital assets. It doesn't answer a lot of these questions, but at least it. Uh, you know, would, if enacted, sort of prod regulators to think more about it. And, and I think just the fact that you have a bipartisan bill on the table now, um, uh, you, you know, you will have more policymakers thinking about this stuff. So this might be a good opportunity for the industry to sort of come together and start thinking about, um, uh, you know, think, think clar you know, what, what places where they need clarity from policymakers. I think one place where we really, really need clarity is tax. And I'm not talking just about like 6050i and stuff like the broker reporting rules, which, you know, did get us all, you know, up in a frenzy uh, a year or so ago. But I'm talking about, you know, something that I think is pretty fundamental, which is like, are we all in entities or, or is there some new type of property that digital assets create that allow us to, you know, take the position that we just are holding and trading a bunch of capital assets? And I would love for it to be the latter, but I, I just, I don't know how we get there necessarily under current law. Right. Right, which is sort of the the the, the point of the the deemed entity analysis. So, yeah. um, we talked a little bit about LP tokens. Uh, we could certainly talk about it more, but let's talk a bit about um, staked ETH. 
yeah. uh, and, and, and how you would characterize that under a deemed entity analysis. Yeah. <laughs> Um, or similar, I guess. What like Ave tokens or yeah, or... yeah, yeah. So so I so I actually wrote wrote about this quite a bit, um, um, and, and most recently in last month's uh, Bankless DAO newsletter. Uh, anytime I have a thought, by the way, I just I just publish it to Bankless DAO's new, newsletter. That's why I'm, I, he's I, not publishing. He's not plugging Bankless DAO's yeah, newsletter. Yeah, I'm not. I, it's not. Read the uh, Bankless uh, DAO no, newsletter. Yeah. Read the Bankless <laughs> DAO newsletter. All <laughs> listeners. Um, it's called I, I think the the latest. DeFi Alpha is tax optimized staking, um, and I was in last month's issue, so so May issue, and, and I talk about um, you know the differences between um, uh, I, I create I, I sort of create this framework one where I distinguish between what I call liquid staking and what I call illiquid staking. Uh, terrible names, but as I say in the article, I am a tax lawyer, not a marketer. Um, what I mean by liquid staking is anytime you deposit a token in exchange for another token that represents a share in a pool. Okay, so I talked about Curve LP tokens already. That would be liquid staking. Um, wrapped stake ETH on Lido would also be liquid staking. Compound tokens would be liquid staking, right? So compound, you know, you you put liquidity in, and then the smart contract, you know, lends you know lends your liquidity out and earns interest, and you own a C token, which basically represents this you know hopefully ever growing share of this or this share of a hopefully ever growing pie, right? Right, like whatever is going on inside the smart contract. And I distinguish that from illiquid staking. By illiquid staking, I mean, you might or might not take back a token when you contribute to a smart contract, but you, you whatever you get back is not um, a token that represents a share in an ever-changing pool. So like, for example, on Lido, you might stake ETH in exchange for Steeth, right? Staked ETH. But one Steeth is just a bailment token. It's just like the right to get back ETH that the amount of ETH that you staked to begin with. It's not this, it's not a share in a pool that's changing. It's just one for one ratio. Right? And I call that illiquid staking. It's it's liquid, obviously, because you can you can trade the steeth, but but like your your actual rewards, your future rewards are not liquid. Those just get credited to your wallet, you know, on a current basis. So they're not sort of conveniently wrapped in a token that can be transferred. So what I say is that under traditional tax principles, liquid staking looks like an entity because you know it looks like stock in a corporation. You you have this thing, you know, the wrapped state teeth or, you know, rocket pool ETH or, com, you know, C, you know, C tokens or, or whatever. And, and it, it's, it's the share in this pool that, that is doing stuff um, like a business. Whereas illiquid staking, you, you know, it doesn't feel as much like you're sharing with other people. It feels more like a securities loan of some sort. Like you're, you're, you know, you, you've loaned out your ETH, you, or you, you know, you've, you've, um, uh, you've posted it as collateral to someone or, or something like that. And in exchange, you're earning these co this constant fee revenue. And uh, there I say, you know, maybe you don't have an entity, but you're taxed currently on the rewards. So like th there, there's this like tax difference where, you know, if you have an interest in an entity, then, you know, as we, we've been saying for the last, you know, whatever hour, as long as this podcast has been going, like you have to figure out that their consequences. And most people seem to be saying, well, that entity is probably a foreign corporation. That's not a PFIC. So no pass through tax. Whereas if you do illiquid staking, you maybe don't have an interest in an entity, but you're getting current rewards and you're taxed currently at ordinary income rates on those rewards as they come in. So different, different tax treatment, probably different um, tax consequences. Awesome. Well, Jason, thanks so much for coming up on an hour and a half. I knew it'd be a substantive um, podcast, but I also, uh, I think, um, I, I think the way you break it down makes it a lot more easy than what people would expect a tax lawyer to do, right? Like, you know, just, you know, throw out a bunch of citations, people just like, huh? Yeah, <laughs> you know, so I, we're I, able do, to... I do my best. I do my best. I, uh, Excellent. I also don't have a good memory for citations. So, uh, 
that works to your favor on a podcast <laughs> exactly. sometimes because nobody nobody's going to sit there going, "Oh, hold it." He said, "Rule eighty, the form eighty three hundred. Let me flip through." Oh yeah, you know. Really? And we don't do the whiteboard. We don't do the projection screen on this either. We do the faces as a podcast. Yeah. So. <laughs> Excellent. So once again, thanks so much. Um, and and so if people, so we, we know a little bit. I typically say, if people want to get in touch with you, where can they go? They can certainly go to the Bankless newsletter, which he writes every month. Duh, duh, duh. And where else can they find you? Yeah, uh, I mean, you can look me up. I'm a tax partner and head of digital assets at Freed Frank. Uh, it's spelled Fried Frank, like a corn dog. Um, <laughs> you can also add me on Twitter at uh, uh, Crypto Tax Guy ETH. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty readily available, fully doxed everywhere, CryptoTaxGuy.eth. <laughs> There you go. Well, thanks so much. You take care. All right. Thanks for having me. Take care.